good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here today. It's great to be with you here on site. I want to welcome all those again for uh, joining us online. Great to have you guys with us. Um, well, hey, I want to thank everybody for all the birthday wishes this past week. Uh, so many of you just left messages on our church Facebook page, so thank you for that. Um, hey, I'm excited about the message today, so I just want to ask you to grab your Bibles. If you have them, you can turn to the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 13. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can pull everything up electronically. We have the notes there. And you were probably handed one of these uh, paper forms uh, when you came in with our notes. And the way we're ending the message today, you're going to need that um, just as we reflect on um, what the Lord speaks to us today. But we're in week number seven in our summer series called Power Up. And today we're talking about powering up over anxiety. And I'll tell you what, man, this past week as I was studying this, um, there is one thing for sure, and there is just a gajillion uh, resources out there on fear and anxiety. I mean, websites, books, podcasts, YouTube videos, you name it. There's millions and millions of resources. Some are good, some not so great, uh, some coming from a godly perspective and, and some not. But it almost, um, there was so many of them. Um, I, I, at one point this week, was like, my Lord, there's just so much information out there. And I had this sense, looking at anxiety, of almost feeling anxious of, man, how do you cover all this? And then I just felt like the Lord just gave me some peace. He's like, Mark, you know what? Um, not calling you to worry about all that. Just calling you to be obedient to the word that I've given my church this week. So, come on, church. We're going to look at Numbers chapter 13 today. Um, and uh, just bring out some points of what the Lord is sharing with us on powering up over anxiety in all of its different forms, man. Um, fear, uh, panic, uh, terror, worry, timidity, in all the phobias that you could ever think of or imagine, some you can't even pronounce. But we want to look at this thing called anxiety today that could be arguably um, one of the number one things that people struggle with. Um, and uh, so, you know, what is it? It's an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that something or someone is a threat. Okay, so we're believing something is a threat or someone is a threat, and we get this icky feeling inside. But this is, watch this, what fear and anxiety does is it robs us of our peace that God wants us to walk and live in and it causes uncertainty. So today, as we talk about anxiety, um, we're not talking about a facilitating fear, um, a, a fear that could be helpful, um, a, a fear like, you know, that, that might be in us where you're getting too close to the edge of a cliff, and you, had, you know, we've all had that with something that could be dangerous. Um, we get this feeling inside like, you know what, um, I don't want to fall here. I don't want to get hurt. So there's this feeling inside of us. That's a facilitating type of fear. That's good. We're, talk about, we're talking today about the debilitating type, the type that hurts us, the type of anxiety and fear that can hold us back. And, you know, we have to know that anxiety is real. Um, yes, it is something we feel, but it, it is real. Um, it's no respecter of persons. Have you noticed that? Like, fear can just come on anyone at any time. Um, you know, um, those that don't know the Lord uh, struggle with anxiety, but those of us that know the Lord Jesus as our, as our Savior, we can struggle with anxiety uh, as well. And the thing about when Christians struggle with anxiety, or even the last couple weeks when we talked about depression— we were talking a lot about this in our, in our small group. We had a summer small group that met on Friday. This came up multiple times just this past Friday in our small group. It's almost like when a Christian struggles with depression or anxiety, it's a double whammy. It's a double whammy because he, the, the first whammy is we're struggling with depression or anxiety. The second whammy is, well, I'm a Christian, and when I'm struggling with something like that, 
I feel all this shame and guilt and condemnation because, man, I'm a Christian and, and Jesus died and rose again and I have the power of God living inside me. Man, I shouldn't be struggling. I should be strong in the Lord. And many times we don't uh, because of things going on in our life. And so not only are we struggling, struggling with the anxiety, but then we're struggling with the shame that we are, so we have a tendency to walk around with a mask on, like, hey, I'm good. You know, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm fine. But inside, we're like, I can't admit what I'm really going through. I can't talk to anybody because if I do, man, it's just like an indictment on God. It's an indictment on my own faith that, you know, I'm not walking out what I really live. Come on, has anyone ever felt that? It's a double whammy, church. You know, but God wants us to get to a place where whatever we're struggling with, whatever's going in, uh, on inside of us, that, you know, it doesn't mean that we're bad people or there's something wrong with us. The last couple of weeks when we talked about, you know, if we're struggling with depression, it's a sign. And we talked about how it's a sign of, of an area that God wants to get into and heal us in our soul. The same with anxiety and fear. When we're struggling with anxiety and fear, it's a sign, but it's different than depression. Watch this. When we're struggling with anxiety and fear, it's a sign that something is interrupting our life. The life that God wants us to live, to have peace, something's interrupting my peace. Something's trespassing where it shouldn't be. And it should be like this signal that goes off, like, man, something's, something's trespassing. Okay, now, um, anybody have those smart doorbells these days, like ring doorbells? Um, yeah, kind of like first service. No one wants to raise their hand because, yeah, Mark, that's the point. I don't want anybody to know that. I get it. I get it. But many of you have ring doorbells or another brand name. But, you know, back in the day, you know, you'd knock on the door. And then there was the doorbell, ding dong. And now there's this really cool technology where when somebody steps on your property, walks up to your steps, okay, you can get a signal alert on your phone. No matter where you're at, you see, oh, okay, no problem. It's the Amazon guy. I'm expecting a package. Oh, no problem. It's family. Oh, no problem. It's neighbors. Oh, no problem. But you get that signal that someone's on your property because it could be someone you're not expecting it could be that interruption of something not good it could be somebody coming on to try to harm or steal or break in and isn't it cool that you get that alert well that's what fear is church fear can be that alert that signal that if there's nothing wrong with you you're not a bad person but something is interrupting something is coming to trespass on what belongs to god and that's you and I thought of a cool way to illustrate that is just to show some pictures in a minute here of, of some pictures that have been captured on real ring doorbells. I didn't want to give any glory to any bad robbers or burglars. I wanted to find some fun ones. So these are my top three favorites of these uh, pictures that were actually captured on a ring doorbell. Um, and the first one here, as you can see on the left, it's a bumblebee, man. It's a, it's a bee. Isn't that the coolest picture? Like, it's just like frozen in time, just like that bee with his wings out. And he's captured on this ring doorbell. And then you see the, the frog in the upper right. And then you see what I think is like a praying mantis or some type of bug like that. But... Man, that, that's just cool. Well, church, I want that to illustrate that when we're feeling anxiety, there's something that God wants us to respond to, okay? Because many ways we respond in, th in ways that aren't healthy, but look at it this way. Look at it as, as a signal that something's interrupting my peace. Something's trying to trespass on what belongs to God, and that's me. Come on, church. Amen? Amen? You know, David did this. Um, been trying to encourage the church that uh, great men and women in the Bible struggle with depression and anxiety. And we see David here, when, when he was struggling with fear and anxiety, it was like a signal that went off to turn his attention to God to help him through this. Look at this. In Psalm 55, it says, Fear and trembling overwhelm me. Guys, this is King David, the one that... Killed Goliath, I can't stop shaking. Really? 
wow, that's encouraging to me that King David was at a place where he was overwhelmed to the place where he couldn't even stop shaking. But watch what it says. But I will call on God and the Lord will rescue me. Look at this next one. I'm losing all hope. I'm paralyzed with fear. Wow. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, not only the emotional feeling of fear, but then it just tends to affect you physically. I mean, man, it's real. It's the real deal. And he says this, but I remember the days of old. I'll ponder all your great works and think about what you have done. So church, fear and anxiety is real. There's no shame, no condemnation, but may it now be a signal that something's trying to interrupt your life and the, the peace that God wants us to walk in. Something's trespassing. It's not God's plan for your life. Amen? God's plan is not for us to be overcome with fear and anxiety. And watch this. I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. Listen to this. It's also not God's plan for us to manage fear and anxiety. Because sometimes we think, oh, I just need to manage this. Well, managing's better than being overcome, but there's even a better way. And God hasn't called us to be overcome. He hasn't called us to manage it. He's called us through him to overcome it. Amen? And today, I want to give you some hope that, that in the Lord, in his power, his strength, not ours, but in him, there's ways that we can overcome this, the anxiety and fear that um, are coming against us. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 13, uh, the fourth Old Testament book. Um, it's the story, some of you may know, it's the story of the 12 spies. Okay? Well, in a minute we're going to read, but let me catch you up to speed, bring some context to this story. Okay, so let's jump back to... Two books, second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. Check this out. So God's people, the Israelites, are in slavery under evil Pharaoh in Egypt for 400 plus years. They're crying out to God, God save us, God deliver us. God hears them. He raises up Moses. Moses goes in and confronts Pharaoh, let my people go. After several times, Pharaoh finally let um, God's people go. And God chooses Moses to lead the people out of slavery, through the, through the desert, into the promised land. Now we're finally in numbers. Several months after that, they're just, they, they can almost see it. They can almost smell it. They're like, I, man, the promised land, man, we're almost there. And God calls Moses to raise up these 12 scouts, if you will, to go scout out the land. So that's where we pick it up here in Numbers 13. Read with me. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan. Watch this. Which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Okay, so, so how many tribes of Israel were there? There were 12. 12 tribes of Israel. So basically what God was asking Moses to do was get one scout to represent each of the 12 tribes. So there were 12 scouts or 12 spies that were supposed to go out and explore the land. So Moses raises up these 12. Out of all the 12, some of you may have heard two, you might be familiar with two of them, Joshua and Caleb, right? Joshua and Caleb were two of the 12. And this is what God asked the 12 scouts to do. He goes, go in, go in and... and, and Look at the people. Like, are the people strong or are they weak? Like, look at the land. Is it good or bad? Like, look at the cities. Are they fortified or are they not? You know, look at the soil. Is the soil fertile or is it poor? Um, look at the trees. Like, are there trees in the land or not? And one last thing, Moses, tell the scouts to bring back some of the fruit of the land. So we're going to jump down to verse 23, and we're going to pick it up from here. And church, we're going, to bring, we're going to get three keys out of this. Okay, check this out. Verse 23 says, when they reached the valley of Eshcol, these 12 spies, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. So church, check this out. 
Um, I remember in Sunday school, you know, seeing the little pictures of this. But, man, if you've never read this before, check this out. They're going into the promised land, right? The land God is giving his people. And, you know, they're supposed to bring back some of the fruit. Well, they get this cluster of grapes. It's so big, like, they have this pole, and one guy's got the pole on his shoulder, and the other guy has this pole on his shoulder. And this, there's this enormous cluster of grapes. Can you picture it? Like, we go to Giant Eagle, and we get a thing of grapes, right? But this cluster of grapes was so humongous that they had two people that had to carry it. Man, these grapes must have been like the size of cantaloupes or basketballs or watermelon. Can you imagine that? Man, this was an awesome land that God was wanting to give his people. It says that place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they, they scouted for 40 days, and they returned from exploring the land. Now watch this. This is their report. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported them to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land in which you sent us, and you know what? It does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit to prove it. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there, which were giants. The, um, now watch all the ites. You know, all the ites were like the... The enemies, the Malachites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And they said, the land's good, but oh my gosh. it's Man, I don't know. And then in verse 30, it says, Then Caleb, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses. Why? He said, no, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Look at the confidence in his heart, church. And verse 31 says, But the men who had gone up with him, the ten, the ten spies, the ten scouts, like Joshua and Caleb spoke up, no, we can do it. But the other ten, they said this, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. See, not only did the ten spies believe in their heart that someone or something was a, a threat, causing that, that icky feeling in, the, in their heart, stealing and robbing their peace and causing uncertainty, but not only did they feel in their heart, but they began to spread a negative word about the whole idea. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. They're giants. We saw the Nephilim there. The, the descendants of Anak come from Nephilim. Those were the giants. And watch this last part, church. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Wow. Wow. Well, man, I'm encouraged because in this text, there's three huge, important things that we can take out of this and apply them to our life. That we don't have to be overcome by fear or manage fear, but we, through Jesus' power and strength in us, we can overcome fear. So if you're taking notes today, write this first one down. Overcoming anxiety, number one, here's, here's the first thing. We have to remember anxiety's source and God's ability. I know that's kind of long, but that's the first thing we need to do. We need to remember anxiety's source and God's ability. So what is the source of fear? Where does it come from? What's the origin of fear? I'm not talking about the facilitating helpful fear. I'm talking about the hurtful, debilitating fear that holds us back and robs us of our peace. What's the source of that? Many of us know it right here. But when we're staring at it right there, we tend to forget that the source of anxiety and fear is Satan himself. It's from the pit of hell. And Satan wants none other. I mean, you know, he can't stop us from getting saved and knowing Jesus. So what, do you, what does he want to do? He wants to steal our peace. He wants to rob us of what God has for us. And it's from the enemy. It's from the enemy trying to interrupt what God has for us, and trespass on what belongs to God, and that's us. 
The Bible says, very familiar verse in 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, for God has not given us a spirit. Notice there, see, it's a spirit of fear and timidity. But God has given us power, love, and self-discipline, or a sound mind. Amen? Did you know that when we forget the source of fear, many times we know it right here, but when we're faced, when we forget that anxiety is from the devil, do you know what else happens? We have a tendency to also forget God's ability. It kind of goes hand in hand. When we forget that fear is from the devil, we also forget God's ability at the same time. This is exactly what happened to the ten spies. Let me give you three sub-points under this first point of remembering anxiety source and God's ability. The ten spies forgot. Number one is this. Did you notice how the ten spies forgot who God was? They forgot who God was. These guys were, were children of God. They were, they were Israelites. They, they forgot who God was. They forgot that God was all-powerful. These were the same people that witnessed with their own eyes God separating the Red Sea. They walked across on dry ground. When they turned around, they saw the water come down on the Egyptian army. They forgot that. They forgot who God was. They forgot that God was the one who had fed them and given them drink in the wilderness by manna and quail and water from the rock. They forgot that God was the one that when they were walking, their shoes did not wear out. They forgot who God was, church. They forgot God's power, and many times we do the same. See, they said in verse 31, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Many times we do the same thing. We forget who God is. We forget his power and ability. Look at the second thing the ten spies forgot. They forgot what God said. Not only did they forget who God was, they forgot what God had said. They forgot all the promises that God had made to them. Did you notice in verse 1 it says, Send men to explore the land of Canaan. And God said it, which I am giving to you. See, God made a promise. God was saying, hey guys, you're my people. I've taken you out of bondage, leading you through the desert. Here's your promised land, which I'm giving you. You're, it's, it's basically yours. You just got to go. You just got to get there. It's already yours. A land flowing with milk and honey. An amazing promise from God. But they forgot that. When fear and anxiety was staring, staring at them in the face, they forgot who God was. They forgot what God had said. And the third thing they forgot is who they were. They forgot who they were. They forgot that they were God's possession, that they belonged to God. Look at this verse 33. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Oh, we're we're just nothing. We're, you know, we're just, you know, like this to God. We don't matter. And, and, And we looked the same to them. I think that's an interesting thing that they, like, I can see how they, you know, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, but we looked the same to them. How do you know? Did you have a conversation with them? Nowhere in Scripture does it record that the 12 scouts went and had a conversation and say, hey, how do you see me? Do you see me as a grasshopper? No, there was no conversation. They were just continuing that negative self-talk. You see that? I'm just a grasshopper. I'm nothing to God. They forgot who God was. They forgot what God said, and they forgot who they were. Come on, church. Doesn't that happen to us? when fear and anxiety, which is so powerful and overwhelming sometimes. But church, I want to encourage you, give you hope today, that through God's power and strength, when we remember the source of fear that's from the pit of hell, it's from Satan himself, and we remember God's ability, we can overcome that through him. You know how we do that? We do that by magnifying God. Magnifying God. The Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You know, this week, I've heard this verse so many times. This week, I was, I was asking God, I'm like, God, if you are big, like, isn't God the biggest? Now, we all know right here, God's bigger than Satan, right? He's bigger than all the giants, because the giants in the Bible represent what faces us today, okay? We all know in our brain that God's the biggest. If we already know that in our brain, why do I have to magnify God? Do you ever think of that, like, 
God, if God's already big, why do I have to magnify him? I'll tell you why. Because many times, here's what happens, okay? I have this, I have this sheet here, and I'm pretty sure that most of you can see on this side, what does it say? God. And uh, maybe you can see, depending, you know, what does this say on this side? Giants. God, giants. Notice which one's bigger, because God is bigger than all our giants, okay? But see, here's what happens sometimes. When we're right in the face of fear and anxiety and all the giants, you know, trying to intimidate us, here's what we do. Satan wants us to magnify the giant. And so it's like, we're like, oh my gosh, you know what? I know you guys can't see it from where you're sitting, but when I hold this magnifying glass up to the word giant, it's way bigger than the word God. Because Satan just wants me to go around and he just wants that, that giant to be right in front of my face he wants it to look so big. He wants that fear and anxiety right there. And it's like, wow, that giant is way bigger than God. But you know, the Bible says that's why we have to magnify God. That means, you know, instead of staring at my giant, I need to understand that God is way bigger than my giants. Come, let us magnify the Lord. God's already big. We're called to just make him bigger and bigger in our own perspective when it comes to our fear and anxiety, church. And we do that first and foremost by remembering the source that fear doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. Fear, now think of it this way. This is an interruption to my peace and my joy and what God has for me. S Satan's trying to trespass on ground he don't own. I, I belong to God. Amen, church? So that's the first one. The second one is this. How do we overcome fear? Number two, admit it, name it, and attack it. Like I said, these points are kind of long this week. Remember anxiety source and God's ability. Number two, admit it, name it, and attack it. Man, this is good. You ready for this? Okay, so let's talk about these three. What do you mean admit it? Admit it. If we're going to overcome anxiety and fear, and I mean, really this goes for anything that's coming at us, we have to first and foremost admit it, meaning this. We have to stop hiding it. We have to stop denying or hiding that I might feel that I'm struggling with something, that there's a giant trying to attack me, that I have, you know, some anxiety and fear trying to rob me of my, of my peace. I have to admit it. Why would God ever want me to do such a painful thing? Oh, really? I have to admit that to somebody? Here's why. Because whenever we don't, watch this, that means we are going through it alone, right? If I don't tell anybody, we're like, well, God knows, right, right. But God has called us to be a part of a body we call the body of Christ. Why? Because the body of Christ is Christ manifested. When we come together, we are all part of God's hands and Christ's feet and in his mouthpiece to help each other grow and be encouraged and strengthened. The Bible says one can, can put a thousand to flight, but two can put ten thousand to flight. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one because when one falls, the other can help the other one get up. You know what it says in the New Testament? It says we're, we're supposed to be in community. We're supposed to be together. We're never called to live life on, a, on our own. Okay? And that's why when we are struggling with something, God calls us to admit it. And it doesn't mean you have to plaster it all over your social media. And it doesn't mean you have to get up on the platform and tell the whole world. But you know what? God's saying admit it to somebody that you trust someone in the body of Christ that can help you, that means you're not going through it alone. Amen? That is so powerful, church. It's it almost like it, it just exposes the enemy and his power, the enemy's power becomes less. I love this verse I found this week in 2 Corinthians 7, talking about the great apostle Paul. Watch this. It says, when we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction with battles on the outside. Watch this. And fears where? 
Oh, on the inside. So Paul was struggling with something that I could not see. Sometimes we're going through something on the inside. Nobody can see it. Nobody knows. We put on our happy face. We put on our church face. We put on our Sunday face. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Fine. I'm good. Everything's good. And underneath, we're like, man, I'm really dealing with something on the inside. And God just, just admit it to somebody. Like, like, let go of the pride and humble ourselves and just talk to somebody that somebody can encourage you and pray for you because we see that in Scripture because Paul goes on to say, but God who encourages those who are discouraged encourages us how? By the arrival of Titus. And when Titus and Paul got together, watch what happens. Titus brought encouragement to me and I was filled with joy. Church, we got to admit it. The next one is we have to name it. Name the fear. Name the anxiety. Mark, what do you mean? Name it. Instead of being generic and saying fear or anxiety, get specific and name it. What is the fear? What is the anxiety? Get very specific on naming it. You might say, why? Why is that important? We see this in Scripture. Let me give you the New Testament and Old Testament next. But in the New Testament, remember in the Gospels when Jesus was confronted with the demon-possessed man? Jesus has this guy coming at him, and Jesus asks him a question. And Jesus says, this guy's obviously struggling with something. And Jesus says, what is your name? In church, he was not asking for the guy's name. He was, he was talking to the spirit be, be, that, was, it, that, was, that, was effect, that was coming against the man, okay? And he spoke to the spirit, and he goes, what is your name? And the spirit answered and says, legion, for we are many. And after that, Jesus was a, you know, J- Jesus cast you know, the spirit out. Why is that important? I believe Jesus today is calling us to name it, to get specific. You know, fear and anxiety is generic, covers a lot, but name it, name it. In, 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 the, in the Old Testament, we see in Numbers 13, our text today, we see in verse 31, the scouts came back and said, look at this, we saw giants. But what does it say right after that? It says, they're actually the descendants of Anak. You see how they, they went from generic to very specific? Yeah, there's giants in the land. In fact, I'm going to name it. They're actually the giants of Anak, from Anak. And I see in Scripture that God is encouraging us to name the fear, name the anxiety. Why? To give it credit, to give it glory? No, 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 no. To, again, expose it for what it is for what it's trying to do, for how it's trying to rob us of our peace, so we can diagnose it correctly and get the answer from Jesus. You know, we don't go to the doctor and, and, go, and, and the doctor comes in and say, Doc, I'm just not feeling well. Okay, well, let me write you something up. No, the doctor's going to ask you questions to find out specifically what's going on so he can give you the correct prescription, right? Well, when we name the fear... What we're doing is we're getting a revelation ourselves like, wow, it's not just fear and anxiety. It's, you know what? The Holy Spirit's showing me that I have a fear of being alone. I have a fear of failure. I have a fear of rejection. I have a fear of getting in front of people. I have a fear of lack that I'm going to run out of supplies and provision. Like, name it, because whatever that fear is, God has an answer and a promise in his word to come against that. Okay? If you have a fear that you're going to run out, and you have a fear of lack, then you need to know that that's an interruption of your peace, and that's Satan trespassing on you, God's possession, and God has an answer to say, no, just remember, my ability is that I'm your provider, and I'm never going to leave you. That's why we have to name it, church. And before we go on, let, let me just share. This is kind of a bonus, okay? Um, I want to share. This is a personal story, so I don't want this to be legalistic. Um, basically, eat the meat, spit out the bones, what I'm going to tell you here in a minute, okay? Um, but 
when you name your fear, be careful how you verbalize it. Don't take ownership of it, though, okay? Like, you have to watch what comes out of your mouth and the words you're using with the possessive pronouns that you use. Because sometimes, I, I've heard people say this, yeah, well, you know, would you pray for my depression? Would you pray for, for my anxiety? And see, God really showed me this a couple years ago when I was suffering from migraines. And I remember several times I would go up to people and say, man, would you just pray for my migraines? And one time the Holy Spirit just says, Mark, um, you know, don't take possession of those. When you say my migraines, what I'm saying is, is oh yeah, I, I just want to take ownership of that. And these, these headaches are mine. I, I want to I own them. I want them to be in my life forever. And God showed me, he goes, don't say my. Just, give it, just say these migraines that I'm suffering with right now. Don't say my, my depression, my fear. That's where I'm saying I'm trying not to be legalistic. You just, in your own, you know, just be conscientious yourself on how that comes out. Because, because it took time for me to develop that discipline. Because I, you know, a couple weeks, months later, I would go, hey, you know, my, I mean, the. <laughs> Have you ever had someone just kind of like conveniently forget or leave something in, at your house or your garage that you didn't want? Do you ever have that? Like there's something that someone doesn't want and they kind of like let you borrow it, but they don't want it back. And all of a sudden now it's like in your garage, in your house. You're like, what is this doing here? I don't want this thing. I got to get rid of this thing. Like give it back to the owner. Come on, church, the migraines, the fear, the depression, don't, don't claim ownership of that. Amen? Give it back to where it belongs. It belongs in the pit of hell. Okay? And so, so just, let's just change the language. Deb and I, are, we're trying to, and it's hard. It's like a discipline you have to develop. But, you know, we're, we're trying to be very aware of saying this phrase. Oh, this is just driving me crazy. And we're just like, you know what? No! It's not driving me crazy. I have a sound mind in Jesus. I'm not going to let anything drive me crazy. Stop saying things that are like you're confessing it on yourself. Don't claim ownership of the fear. Yes, name it. You know what? Sometimes there is a spirit of fear, of loneliness or rejection that wants to interrupt me. But I'm not claiming it as mine anymore. Amen? All right. Um, the, third, the third thing under admit it and name it and attack it, is attack it. So God has not called us to lie down and be defeated, but fight this church. We've not called to be overcome. We're not called to manage it. You know, we're called to, to attack it back with God's truth. You know, some believe the lie that, well, I'm always going to be stuck with this. This is my lot in life. No, it might be a long process. There might be a, a, a you know, a, the enemy might be behind it, just always there attacking us, but it's not your lot in life to be living and overcome with things that God is not giving us. So we need to have a little Joshua Caleb spirit. There were 12 spies, but only 16.6%. Two out of 12, Joshua and Caleb were the ones that said, no, 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 be quiet. Let's go take the land. We can certainly do it. We can certainly do it. You know what? I can't do any of this in my own strength, but I can do it through the strength and power of Jesus. Amen? Third point. Okay, how do we overcome fear and anxiety? Remember anxiety source and God's ability. Admit it, name and attack it. Lastly, keep renewing our mind. Keep renewing our mind. What does this mean? I need to live in a way that my mind is in it, a place where it's in my original state that Jesus wants it to be, rewired, reprogrammed, to have the mind of Christ whenever fear and anxiety come my way. I want to renew my mind. I want to keep thinking on truth. I want to respond differently. 
I want to be reprogrammed and rewired that a different response is thought and spoken. Look at what it says in Psalm 77. It says, but then I recall all you've done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They're constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Sometimes we say, I can't stop thinking about this anxiety and fear. Well, David was saying, man, but, but God, it's coming at me, but I want to I renew my mind. I, wanna, I can't stop thinking about you, Lord. I can't stop thinking about your promises and, and who you are and how you're powerful and, and, and who I am in you. So we're going to close doing two more things. Hang with me, two more things. I want to show a two-minute video from Kyle Winkler. He's the guy we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, he's the one that developed the Shut Up Devil app. I want to show you a two-minute video from him on how do we renew our minds. And then we're going to close differently this Sunday. What we're going to do is we're going to take these three main points that we just talked about. We're going to put on some instrumental soft music. We're just going to have some quiet time as a congregation reflecting on what God is telling us today. And we'll answer some questions. Sound good? Watch this video. How to renew your mind is answered by understanding two words in Romans 12 2. Transform and renew. Transform is metamorphosis, which is the process of something old into something new. Think caterpillar into butterfly. And that's the purpose of renewing your mind. It's to manifest the new life of Christ in you. This brings us to renew, which means to resume to an original position after an interruption. Simply put, when you said yes to Jesus, and you were born again, you became a new person in Christ. This means Jesus' identity became your default original position. Made new, made right, made whole, made holy. Anything contrary to those things who Jesus is, such as fear, temptation, stress, condemnation, and so on, is an interruption. Renewing your mind then is simply the process of getting back to your original position in Christ by interrupting the interruptions. And you do this by thinking on and speaking God's truths. For example, to renew your mind from feeling fearful, think on and declare something like 2 Timothy 1.7. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but I have power, love, and a sound mind or to renew your mind when you deal with something like condemnation. Think on and declare a verse like 2 Corinthians 5.21. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. There are truths all throughout God's word for any interruption you face. One last thing. Though renewing your mind really is as simple as interrupting the interruptions with God's truths, remember that metamorphosis transformation is a process. A caterpillar doesn't turn into a butterfly overnight, but over time. So you have to be diligent and patient. Your mind has to be rewired from years of old patterns. That's what thinking and speaking on truth does. It literally, scientifically and psychologically, rewires or renews your brain, and that takes time. So be sure to give yourself plenty of grace. Mm, isn't that good? So church, here's, our, here's how we're going to end today. We're going to put some soft instrumental music on right now. We're going to take a few minutes, and this is our response time today. We want to respond to the message. Um, Remember what uh, we just heard in that video is renewing our mind is knowing our position in Christ and seeing these things as an interruption. But let's interrupt the interruption by thinking and speaking on God's truth. So as you can see, whether you're using the YouVersion app, you see the questions at the end, or whether you're going to use the paper, we'll also have it on the screen. We have three questions today of how we're going to respond to the message. We've taken them from our three main points. Remember anxiety's source and God's ability. So the question is, what is God specifically calling you to remember today? The second thing we said is admit it, name it, and attack it. Here's a question. 
What fear do I need to admit and name, and how is God calling me to attack it? The third thing we said is keep renewing our mind. So moving forward, what will I specifically do to renew my mind? If you're joining us online, um, you can see as well. Please join us. But church, let's take a few minutes and just hear God's voice. There's pens in your seat if you're writing it down, but let's respond to the message today. Jesus, we thank you for today in this message of encouragement that you've given our church. Lord, for all the ways that we as believers are faced with anxiety and fear, and sometimes even shame and guilt on top of that. Lord, I pray today that we would be encouraged, that we don't have to live overcome with it. We don't even have to manage it. We're called to be overcomers through your ability, God, through your power and strength flowing through us. So I pray you'd encourage this congregation today that there's hope. It is a process, as we heard in the video. It's a process, Lord. Help us to give ourselves and others grace. So God, help us to remember where it comes from and your ability. Help us to get to a place where we can humble ourselves and admit it through your Holy Spirit, help us to be able to name it without claiming ownership of it. 
and attack it with your truth. Thinking your truth and also speaking your truth. In Jesus' name. God, just continue to speak to us about this. Thank you, Lord. As you're still eyes are closed, heads bowed, I just want to take a minute and just say if there's someone here or online and you have never, never come to a place of making that decision of accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and receiving the free gift of salvation through the good news and gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Whether you've never done that or you have at one point and you need to recommit that decision, I would like to invite you to pray. Come back to the Lord. Come to Jesus today. Accept his love and salvation in your life. If that's you, just pray, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on a cross to forgive me of my sins. And God, just as you, Jesus, rose from the dead, may you come alive in me. I receive your free gift of salvation. I accept it today. I accept you today. Come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, church, check this out. All of us that did those three questions, you might need to spend more time just contemplating on those questions. And maybe you're a married couple here today. Well, you were kind of individually doing it. Maybe it'd be a good idea if you got with your spouse and had some talk time, talked about those things. Maybe parent to kid, maybe family, like have conversation about this today. Keep the word alive in us. Amen, church? And if you pray to accept Christ today, um, let us know because not only do we want to celebrate with you, but we want to resource you as well. Let us know by taking that connection card and filling that out and letting us know of your decision. If you're online, just let us know with, by the digital connection card. We just want to just encourage you today in that. Well, hey, let's all stand. And like we said, we're kind of ending differently today. I want to ask our prayer teams to come and be available one more time uh, for anyone that might need prayer. Our prayer teams are available. Guys, we love you so much. Uh, don't miss next week because next week is a fifth Sunday. Do you guys know what fifth Sundays mean? Uh, four times a year when there's a fifth Sunday, we like to just bless our church with a snack item. And so next Sunday, we're going to have a snack item for everybody. Give you a little hint of what that might be. Last week was National Ice Cream Day, so it might have something to do with that. So guys, we love you. Bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. See ya.